they won't. Yes, because I'll be connected. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, when not actively um, sharing PowerPoint, we can do that in back. On my side, we can see it. So if you want to, we'll have it over here. Hello, Richard. This is Lou Sullivan. Can you hear me? Afternoon, Hi, Professor. Lou. Hi. How are you? Good. Okay. Good. Okay. Can you do a gallery view for now? Yeah. Are we on mute? <coughs> Hello, everybody. Hi. So are you ready to get started? I'm ready. I'm going to just be a cue. Okay. Twenty-three. Twenty-two. Thirty-two. That's pretty much everybody. That's I think. So. Okay, good. Okay. Yes, yeah. I better put glasses on. It's very hard to do glasses and mask at the same time. Yeah, I it might know. fog up very quickly. Exactly. Well, you'll be able to take it off when you're speaking. Mm -hmm. okay. Are we set, you guys? Yes. All right, John. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. so if you want, you could just do it on the go. Good afternoon, everyone. The academic year has begun at the medical school campus. On tour this morning, I was inspired by the enthusiasm and dedication of our students, faculty, and staff. I'm Don Kaplan, class of 1973, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2021 meeting of the Boston University School of Medicine Dean's Advisory Board. This is our first hybrid meeting, and I welcome those that are here in person and the many of you who are joining us virtually today. Would like to take a moment to welcome the new members of the board who joined us in the spring as special guests and now have officially become members of the board. Their full bios can be found at the DAB web portal. Dr. Gabriella Avellino, Dr. Stephen Burke, Dr. Alaria Conti, Ken Menges, Peter Paul, Albert Rosenthaler, and Dr. Robert Schulze. Also, welcome to Dr. Thomas Richardson, joining today's meeting as a special guest. Dr. Richardson is a 1992 graduate of BU's College of Arts and Sciences and a 2000 graduate of the BU School of Medicine with a PhD in biochemistry. He is a creative innovator and strategist, innovating his, integrating his background as a scientist, engineer, entrepreneur, and business development and strategy executive. He currently serves as the founder and CEO of Plumeria Therapeutics and is president at the Institute for Life Science Entrepreneurship. It is my pleasure to welcome all of these outstanding individuals to the advisory board, and we look forward to their input. Now, before we begin today's presentations, a few technical announcements. This meeting is being recorded to assure the speakers are heard clearly, others will be muted by the host. If you are joining us virtually, we encourage you to submit questions using the chat function. On laptops, the function can be found at the bottom of your screen. On iPads, it can be accessed 
by pressing the three dots in the right upper corner of your screen. The host will be monitoring the chat throughout the meeting. There will be limited time for questions after each segment, but the breakout sessions will also provide you the opportunity for in-depth discussions. And now I'm pleased to welcome Boston University Medical Campus Provost and School of Medicine Dean, Dr. Karen Antman to provide a school update. Dr. Antman. Thank you. We have our technical people here getting the slides up. <laughs> Am I going to be able to advance the slides? Yes. Great. Okay. Good. So that didn't work, by the way. There we go. Uh, so the first thing I want to do is to reassure everybody that the school is financially stable and thriving uh, despite COVID. Uh, as of October 1st, tomorrow, I guess, is it today? No, tomorrow. It's tomorrow. Uh, yes. Uh, we have our first quarter uh, statistics and our grants and expenditures are up slightly, which is good. That means that, that uh, uh, basically the facilities, the, the facilities and administration part of that covers many of our costs. Uh, we know that our master's and medical students uh, have matriculated uh, as uh, planned and therefore we have the tuitions to cover the, the teaching budget. Uh, PhDs are free and they don't pay tuition, so, um, but, but they're here too. Uh, the students are back in person in class since July. I don't know how we had an echo there. The students are back in person in class since July. Uh, our students are required to be vaccinated, although there isn't uh, a waiver for medical or religious uh, objections. But we know that nevertheless, something like 98% of the students, faculty and staff are vaccinated. Uh, the students, faculty and staff are tested once a week. And although we've had occasional cases, no one so far has gotten sick. And obviously we isolate anybody who uh, turns out to be positive on the weekly testing. Um, Certainly our engagement has increased and our burnout actually decreased in our annual climate survey of our clinician. Uh, we actually expected that to be a problem because we expected burnout to be worse, but we had actually put in place a program on inclusion and vitality about 18 months uh, before COVID occurred. And that program has been ongoing throughout COVID. And it was really encouraging to see um, that the engagement did increase and the burnout decreased, uh, despite the fact that, boy, everybody's going uh, full speed. We were also concerned particularly about women and child care uh, issues. So we specifically looked at the women. The women are always more burnout than the men in, on the surveys, but it was no worse. And, it, and in fact, they actually have gotten slightly better. We did have a series of extra grants given out by this, the Clinical Translational Center uh, research center uh, of maybe $5,000 or things like that to help our uh, faculty uh, who were having uh, issues with uh, COVID related additional expenses. So that was in place. Uh, you'll hear more about development from uh, our development people, but I did want to show you that uh, so far we're only in the first quarter, but uh, we project that we'll be at least as good as last year uh, on our cash in. Uh, we ended the, uh, the campaign in 2019. Uh, we still have a number of unpaid uh, uh, pledges, and those are coming in over the subsequent years, and we'll hear more about that later. We always track scholarship trends. Uh, certainly, this is the school's highest priority. We're, we're competing with other schools who have uh, um, made tuition free, such as NYU, uh, the Kaiser S Southern California School, uh, and increasingly other schools have been uh, increasing their scholarships and we need to be doing that too. And you can see that since 2014 and over the course of the uh, campaign, 
we doubled our scholarships and that continues to go up uh, in, the, in the last couple of years as well. Uh, back in 2005, the, we had a, a few $5,000 scholarships. Now we fill need up to about $35,000. Uh, so people can get scholarships as large as $35,000. Uh, and that's quite a difference in, in the support that we've been able to get. Um, much a result of donations from our alumni, uh, parents, friends, and from this board for scholarships. Many of you may have read about our newer affiliation, affiliation with St. Elizabeth Hospital. Um, the, uh, we have 31 affiliates. One of the issues with that is it's very difficult to do education quality control with that many different hospitals. Uh, we have a need for many, many uh, patient beds in order to educate our third and fourth year students clinically. And if they have to drive too far, then that adds the extra expense of having to own a car and get it insured and not pay for parking. Um, so it's really nice to have a, a, bigger, a bigger hospital that has a long tradition of teaching uh, only five miles away from uh, our campus. The executive steering committee of this new affiliation met in June and formed four subcommittees, infrastructure, education, clinical and research, we're certainly working with BMC, who's very uh, enthusiastic about this new affiliation. Uh, some of the residency programs are being uh, uh, combined. We're working on our level one trauma center is working on a level two trauma center application for them. Um, and we're gearing up to open additional clinical rotations in medicine and surgery, in addition to psychiatry, OBGYN, and neurology that were already present on that campus. So we're ramping up the surgical, the surgical and medical rotations and getting faculty appointments in place now. Uh, we're also doing faculty development and participation on BUSN committees because admissions is now pretty much the interviews are done online. We can certainly ask our faculty at Kaiser in California or at, at CEMIC, St. Elizabeth's Medical Center uh, to and they are enthusiastically participating in admissions decisions. We've had some transitions. Our chair of medicine has uh, decided to retire upon the naming of the successor. So that search is underway, that's David Coleman. And our pharmacology chair of 30 years decided that that was probably a reasonable time to step down and, and physiology as well. So we have uh, searches now with for all of these chairs. We have a director search for the National Emerging Infectious Disease uh, Labs as well, and the Cardiovascular Center Director. Uh, we're also standing up a new data sciences and information and informatics board because much more of medicine requires genetic analyses, uh, analyses of electron microscopy data, uh, and clinical databases like Framingham, uh, the Black Women Cell Study, and that sort of thing. So we need more data science. And also, uh, we need to be teaching our students. The data science people need to be teaching our students because they need to be um, articulate in the in data uh, analyses. Uh, and both our graduate students and our medical students need to be uh, educated as well. So we did a basic science review over the summer because pharmacology and physiology chairs are stepping down. Do we go out with one search now or two? It's an opportunity to rethink our structure and rename our departments to be more accurate in, uh, in their names as to what the kinds of research that they do. Our microbiology department would like to be called in the future virology, immunology, and microbiology, putting virology and immunology first. <clears throat> um, because that's the kind of research that is going on in their department and in the needle and in infectious disease. The anatomy and neurobiology group wanted to swap their names so that neurobiology would reflect the kind of science that they do in their department. Biochemistry wanted to add cell biology and physiology and pharmacology may be uh, considering merging as, as pharmacology, physiology, and structural biology. So these are all possible restructurings of our basic science departments. You can see our grant funding for our basic science departments and we 
the two at the bottom, pharmacology and physiology, are the smaller ones, and they could uh, perhaps be merged uh, at some time in the future. Um, microbiology with the with the with the needle grant is is the largest. There, that needle grant in and of itself is about twelve million dollars a year and accounts for the difference between them and the next bigger department. But we, our departments now are ranked somewhere between about eighteenth and twenty fourth, with the exception of physiology. So they're all nationally ranked basic science departments, and we're very proud of them. Uh, so we we basically discussed could we afford to invest in two great chairs at once? Can we recruit a strong chair to the current physiology department or would we have to build it back up again before we could do that? Uh, could we recruit uh, excellent new faculty to physiology with an added own chair? These were all things that we discussed. Uh, or would we be better off recruiting a very strong um, chair to a large department? Not only are we thinking about the future, uh, but we're also continuing to do uh, renovations. We have now architectural plans just about complete. In fact, we're going out for bids now on about a $5.2 million team based classroom. It's planned for completion ahead of our curriculum revision that will use more active learning, hence the need for the team based classroom. Um, and it better integrates our basic and clinical medicine that uses more active pedagogy. Uh, basically, educational neuroscience tells us that the average uh, adult time uh, it, uh, attention span is 10 minutes, and certainly putting them into a room and giving them hour-long lectures that is, is way longer than that. Uh, we're completing a uh, $3 million microbiology space. We are moving them from one side of Albany Street to another. We're obviously backfilling with other needed research space. But the idea is to get microbiology right next to the needle, the Emerging Infectious Disease Lab, and right next to our infectious disease department. So literally, in a small amount of space, we would have people bumping into each other in infectious disease microbiology and emerging infectious disease labs so that they would all collaborate more easily. There's good data, um, published data, that shows that, that uh, location matters when it comes to getting people to collaborate in research. So that's where we have them moving in sometime in October. Uh, that's this month, maybe, maybe in another two weeks, we, we, we think that they'll start to move into that beautiful new space. Um, we just basically uh, are completing an $800,000 anatomy laboratory uh, renovation. Um, thanks to uh, uh, a major uh, donor for us, uh, most important from the student's point of view is that the HVAC will be significantly improved. We're going from something like about five um, air exchanges per hour to about 15. And all of you who uh, either were our physicians yourself or um, or uh, our parents of uh, medical students know how important it is um, for people in the anatomy lab to actually be able to breathe better. Uh, in addition, we have um, uh, new monitors, ultrasound equipment, and um, a new virtual uh, anatomy lab. And uh, so that's very exciting. And finally, we have a, a number of new uh, core facilities that we're going to be doing. Here's the uh, gross anatomy uh, uh, electronic uh, anatomy instrument that we got. Here's the new laboratory. The monitors aren't up yet, but you can see how nice and new lighting too, so that they actually have surgical lighting for the anatomy lab. This is our team-based classroom. This is this is the, the vision for the team-based classroom. It's not in place yet. It will also provide uh, space, not only for the team-based classroom shown here, where each of the teams would be at an individual table, but you can also use it for event space like the white coat ceremony, so we don't have to worry too much about thunderstorms anymore in the summer <laughs> out in the tent. And finally, uh, the state is uh, moving with their plans for the Newton Pavilion. This is, you can see the Newton Pavilion, the current Newton Pavilion in the upper corner. 
Uh, and this is what the new building will look like when they get finished with the renovations. It'll be the Lemuel Shattuck Hospital, and we will now have our fourth hospital on campus. And the construction timeline is shown now. It's actually starting. They opened up the gates and they're working on the uh, renovations, and they intend to move the patients over in January of uh, 2024, so two years of construction. We had last night the Louis, uh, Louis Sullivan professorship installation. It was really a wonderful panel on race. We're planning a celebration of the medical school's 175th anniversary. And uh, we're, our refugee community <coughs> is gearing up for both Haitian and Afghan refugees. So we're off to a great start with our first year students. We expect the arrival of the Afghans fairly soon. They're already uh, coming into the state and other cities. We're investing in new chairs, faculty, and renovations, and we'll continue to be resilient, resourceful, and COVID isn't over yet. Thank you. Uh, are there questions for the Dean? You can use the chat function. Or speak up. Maybe we can look okay. at the gallery here. Uh, you, uh, folks need to unmute. Uh, Dr. Sullivan, if you could unmute. Okay, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes. Good, very good. Uh, thanks very much, Dean Atman, for that presentation. I think it's very comprehensive. One thing that uh, slipped by me, it wasn't clear. The two departments that you're considering merging, a pharmacology and one other, could you comment on that a little bit more, please? Uh, pharmacology and physiology. Ah, right, right. Very good. Uh, yeah. A lot of the teachers actually, if you think about it, a lot of the teachers who do renal physiology also do renal pharmacology. Um, the training grants could be similar. Uh, it's under discussion. Very good. Great. Are there There's other a comments? question right there in the chat. Do we expect our faculty to cover the shadow more after the move and more involvement for the medical students? That's Dr. Schultz. Oh, Dr. Schultz, terrific question. Actually, um, the Shattuck Hospital was a Tufts affiliate uh, in its current location. Uh, I think that that has not uh, been going well most recently, and we are in discussions uh, with BMC and the state about making the new hospital on our campus of Boston University affiliate where our, our uh, medical students would, would do their rotations as well. Uh, the residents would be going back and forth and the specialty services could work uh, both the um, the specialty services, you, obviously the, the docs could just run across the campus and could go from one hospital to the other. Shanine's hand is up, Dr. DeHode. Um, Karen, I have a quick question. In terms of the uh, Lemuel Shadak, you said the, uh, they will go for residency. Do we have a certain residency they will be doing or we will be offering everything? Medicine, surgery, everything, do we know? This is with, 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 with respect to Shattuck or with respect to uh, St. Elizabeth's? Shattuck. Oh, Shattuck. That's, that's early in discussion. Uh, the state actually uh, hasn't made those decisions. But I, I okay. know that, that um, they actually have developed their own relationship with St. Elizabeth's, so it may be a threesome BMC, St. Elizabeth's, and us. Okay, that's good. Thank you. I think so, too. Yeah. Can we look at the gallery view so we can see if anyone else has their hand up? I'm looking, I'm oh, okay, great. Thank you, Corey. Do you see any other questions? Okay, in, in, in that regard, we'll uh, move along. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Dean Antman, for uh, your update on the uh, campus. Um, in addition to the uh, professorship named in honor of Dr. Sullivan, there was also a professorship named this year in honor of Dr. Jerome Brody. Um, and on a personal note, uh, as, as many of you know, I practiced pulmonary medicine for many years. And Dr. Brody and Dr. Gordon Snyder were 
certainly mentors to me as a student at BUSM. And I'm delighted uh, that Dr. Brody has been named uh, and honored with the name chair. Now I'd like to welcome Beth McDermott, Vice President for Development at Boston University, and Suzanne Maselli, Associate Dean for Development at the School of Medicine. Beth joined us as a special guest in the spring and is here today to present updates from the BU Development and Alumni Relations Division, including information about our capital campaigns. Beth? Thank you, Dr. Kaplan, uh, and thank you, Dean Antman, for including myself and my colleague, Suzanne Maselli, whom I know you all know well um, in today's agenda. We're very appreciative um, of your time. Just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about over the next uh, several minutes. A brief recap of our fundraising results, um, a brief uh, conversation about areas of focus for the School of Medicine fundraising for the coming year, and then a bit of a longer range focus as um, Dr. Kaplan intimated, uh, focused on long-term campaign planning, both for the university and then certainly for the School of Medicine as well, and some of the key milestones that we need to meet um, as we move forward in that process. So uh, fundraising, there is, a, there is a quote that I think is attributed to Gandhi, whether or not he said it, I am not sure, but it is something that I think always ties to our fundraising conversation. And that is, you know, um, vision without resources are mere hallucinations. And I think that's one of the things that ensures or that we live with every day, um, both at Boston University broadly and at the School of Medicine specifically. We know that under Dean Antman's vision for the School of Medicine, we have uh, so many important areas to focus on. And it's really the resources that you as members of the Dean's Advisory Board and others who have invested in the School of Medicine that you're really helping to realize and make that vision possible. And Suzanne is going to go into some more detail on that in a moment. Um, I did want to share, though, this particular slide that highlights um, really how important the School of Medicine fundraising is to the university's big picture in terms of fundraising success overall. Um, you know, I know for many years I have always heard that the School of Medicine is the jewel in the crown of the university or sort of the leading edge of the university in many ways. And that's certainly true in terms of fundraising as well. When you look at our results over the course of the last three years and sort of average things out, we know that um, philanthropy for the School of Medicine has averaged about 18% of our overall totals. And for new pledges or commitments that really drive overall annual um, cash, um, it's about 22%. So uh, BU has 17 schools and colleges. So if you did a, a sort of neat average, you would expect every school to contribute 5%. We can't do a neat average because every different school has a different size and scope and scale of mission. But regardless of that, we know that the School of Medicine really outpaces virtually every other um, school or college affiliated with BU. Um, please don't repeat that because I do code at different deeds advisory board meetings, <laughs> but I don't necessarily want to get in trouble with the other deeds. But I did want to point that out and again, thank all of you for the uh, significant impact that you've had, not only in the School of Medicine, but the university more broadly. And I'm going to hand uh, the virtual mic over to Suzanne, who's going to talk specifically about School of Medicine. Thank you, Beth. So I would like to share some giving highlights, and these are gifts that have come in since our last uh, spring Dean's Advisory Board meeting. We would like to give a, a very big thank you to the Department of Medicine for making possible the Jerome Brody Professor of Pulmonary Medicine. I think a number of you joined us for that installation a couple of weeks ago when we recognized the amazing legacy of Dr. Brody at our school and also welcomed Dr. Che Mitzker as the inaugural Brody professor. We also received another gift from the estate of Jack Spivak to support the Jack Spivak Endowment, which is now at close to $15 million supporting neuroscience at the School of Medicine. Every year we receive a gift from the Lewis Wolfson Foundation, which supports the revolving loan fund. This is a low interest loan fund that makes it more possible for our students to be able to uh, alleviate their debt burden. And that fund is at around $11 million right now. Our alum, Dr. Anand, class of 01, established a, a, an endowed fund for students who are pursuing the dual MD, MD MBA degree. The Emergency Physician Foundation recognizes Dr. Olshaker as he steps down as chair from emergency medicine with a visiting lectureship. 
And Mr. Ginwala established an endowed scholarship fund in memory of his wife, who graduated from our School of Nursing at the time and suffered from Alzheimer's disease. So that is the inspiration for this new endowed scholarship fund. Dr. Marcel Willock, a faculty member who was chair of anesthesiology for many years, has established this anesthesiology research fund in honor of current chair, Dr. Rafael Ortega, and it's named after Dr. Ortega's parents. Mr. Newman is supporting our amyloid research in honor of his mother, who was treated by our amyloidosis doctors. And our class of 47 alum, Dr. Hoffman, has established in his wife a scholarship fund at the school. Next slide, please. Thank you. So these are foundation giving highlights once again since our last meeting. Most significantly, the American Heart Association is providing significant grant support for PI Dr. Katya Rabid in her work looking at health disparities among the cancer uh, population. Alzheimer's Research UK Foundation is supporting both Dr. Sunea Pizu as well as Dr. Rhoda O oh in our Alzheimer's Disease Center. The Wildflower Foundation, which is established by Chris Stifel in memory of her husband, continues to support Dr. Connor's amyloid research. And the Metaviver Research and Support Incorporated is supporting Dr. Dennis Jones and his breast cancer research. And now I'd like to share our uh, priorities and initiatives for this current fiscal year. Scholarship, as always, remains a priority, of course. Specifically, we are raising funds in memory of Dr. Paul O'Brien, a number of our 90s alum remember him fondly. He was a faculty member that every first year student got to know, and we have received significant gifts for this scholarship fund. Our alumnus, Dr. David Walton, has established a scholarship fund in honor of the then Dean of Student Affairs and Director of the Financial Services Office, Charles Terrell. We're hoping that others will join Dr. Walton in supporting this scholarship. And of course, you all know about Rebecca Lee Crumpler, her legacy as the first Black American MD to receive a degree from our predecessor institution and the scholarship fund established in her honor. Student support is very important and we wanna recognize and thank the Vertex Foundation for their support of our pipeline programs. And we received support from a number of our alumni parents and friends for these programs. And we have a new student research endowment established from a bequest from Dr. Judith Vidukaitis and we encourage others to support that initiative. As always, the Outreach Band Program is a significant component of our student education experience, and we thank many alumni who support the Outreach Band. Dean Atman spoke about the Gross Anatomy Lab. We'd like to thank Dr. Uh, Mr. Albert Rosenthaler and his wife Debbie for their outstanding support and ask others to join with them in supporting the Anatomy Lab. And we're looking forward to raising funds for the L4 Learning Lab. Our research priorities include, but are not limited to, the National Emerging Infectious Disease Lab, the Chronic Traumatic Encephalopathy Center, our Alzheimer's Disease and Cancer Centers, veterans programs, which are very strong here, and as always, the Framingham Heart Study. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, I think with the news that Suzanne just shared, both in terms of um, gift activity over the past year and areas of focus for the year that we're currently in, really point to the story of momentum for the School of Medicine um, in terms of the areas of impact and supporting um, the vision that you all share with Dean Antman. Um, similar work is happening across the university um, with other deans um, are identifying their priorities and, and um, sharing them with their own advisory boards and with other key stakeholders um, to ensure that folks really have a shared vision and a shared instinct to invest and support on the priorities that have been established or are being established across the university. Um, that work is really the first and most important step in the university moving toward a next comprehensive campaign. As I believe you all recall, the university wrapped up uh, the campaign for BU Choose to Be Great in September of 2019, just a couple of years ago. Um, and because of the momentum that provided, as well as the success of the most recent two years, um, I believe the university is fairly confident that we'll move forward um, into a next comprehensive campaign in the relatively near future. 
Before we do that, though, in addition to the diligence that I just described happening across all the different schools and colleges, we are also um, focusing on doing a different kind of feasibility than we have ever done before as a university. And that's really um, uh, working with outside counsel to do some broader based benchmarking against like universities, um, doing uh, more diligence in terms of uh, both in person interviews with individuals who've chosen to invest in VU, also individuals who we believe might have the capacity to, but have chosen not to, to have a better understanding of what has really animated their donors and what has been obstacles for folks who might have chosen to support other institutions or nonprofits. Um, we'll be doing that work over the course of really the next six months. Six months. Um, the firm with whom we're working will share their findings with both Dr. Brown and with uh, the university's board of trustees. And that will serve as sort of the first set of recommendations for when, where, and how we will move formally into a next comprehensive campaign for the university. Um, following on that, we'll certainly be working on identifying campaign leadership, which in many ways we're already doing, right, by working with many of our leaders across campus, and also establishing a fundraising goal, which would certainly include a specific fundraising goal um, for the School of Medicine as well, and then determining when we share it with the broader world beyond folks like you. Um, so that is our fundraising update, and we certainly welcome any questions, but I also know we have a tight agenda and want to keep things moving along. Yeah, we would very much appreciate if you have comments or questions to address to Suzanne or uh, to Beth. Uh, we could take a brief comment now if we have one, otherwise we will move along. There's a question from Terry Peel on how did this, uh, how did the COVID pandemic impact the operation of the amyloidosis center and other outpatient operations? Obviously, uh, it was a major issue early on in the uh, for everybody across the United States, uh, and certainly people with amyloidosis are immunosuppressed, and it was uh, a risk for them to kind of come out. Uh, certainly, we reopened our research program somewhere around August, and had a very had everybody being tested in the in the unit, and we limited the number of people that could see the patients, but but we could then start to see patients again. Uh, and then once the shots became available, we made sure that all of our patients got injections as all of our immunosuppressed patients, including those from amyloidosis, has got injections. Uh, and now we're trying to get them all their third shot because basically they would certainly be warranting uh, uh, a third shot because of their immunosuppression. So I'd be happy to, uh, Terry Peel, if you want to direct any further questions to me, I'd be happy to answer you in the chat as well. But we're but but we did we we tried to keep them safe and then we got them back as quickly as possible because they do need management. The other hands uh, you've done a great job of uh, taking care of these patients. I understand that amyloidosis has been a big increase in patients applying to come to Boston. Um, the only other question I'd have, I noticed amyloidosis was not on that uh, research uh, list of where you're trying to get more grants for research. I, I would I, hope they would also be included because we have a congressional effort on that. And it would no, be I'm good to, to see them on the list too. Absolutely, Terry. I apologize for that. The amyloidosis center is very much one of our priorities. Okay. So much so that I didn't even think to put it on there. I was just speaking with Dr. Sancho Arwala this morning and reaching out um, from one of our patient families to Dr. Burke to thank them for their hard work. Terry, the wonderful thing about amyloidosis is because it is one of the two best programs in the country, maybe the world. Uh, we do have a number of people who are eager uh, to talk to us about supporting the research. Um, it's, it's not, we, we certainly meet with them all the time, or, or, or basically Suzanne does, uh, but this is, this is not one where we have to go looking for them. They actually come and, um, and are very interested in our research, seeing what we're doing and supporting it. Absolutely. So we thank you for your efforts. Thank you, Terry. And I, I would just uh, have one little comment is that uh, 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 prior to vaccinations, I was admitted for COVID-19 severe case 
I spent 11 months in the hospital ICU mm -hmm. and uh, in rehab. I'm now home after 11 months. So if you know anybody who is skeptical about taking the vaccine, have them give me a call and I'll tell them what they might go through if they live. We're so That's glad it. you're doing well, Terry. Thank goodness yes. for that. Thank you. Are there other chat comments at this point? I think at this point we'll move along. Thank you very much for that comment about uh, a vaccine. It, it truly is tremendously important and uh, any, anything we can do to promote the uh, uh, vaccination of as many people as possible, I think is crucial. Uh, so thank you very much to Beth and Suzanne, both of whom are available uh, at any time uh, when you need them. As a medical school, BUSM is committed to the health of the diverse communities we serve. In 2019, racism in America, racism in medicine, Vertical Integration Group was created at the medical school to identify Mm -hmm. I got amyloidosis. Very good. I'll, I'll reintroduce our two speakers. Are we back on? Yes. One would hope that after a year and a half of COVID Zoom, <laughs> that we have mastered this. But uh, when you look at this room, there are wires and, and, and going everywhere. And uh, a group of people that are dedicated to keeping me on the air, I guess. So I, I am pleased to welcome Dr. Priya Garg. She's Associate Dean for, the Medi for Medical Education. And, uh, and Ms. Kay Elise Green the 2020 to 2021 BUSM Diversity Fellow and a class of 2025 MD, JD, dual degree candidate, far, far above my pay grade here, folks. Uh, they will now share some information about their, their uh, comprehensive initiative. Thank you so much for having us. I have to say, as a medical educator, we're always used to things happening with Zoom these days, so I'm not surprised. Um, but it's really our pleasure to present to all of you today. Um, and for me to have the chance to have Kaylee sitting by me again, who was our inaugural Diversity and Inclusion Fellow um, and left us uh, at the beginning of this year to join the law school and then will come back to us. Today, what we'll be sharing is our school's journey over the last two years to analyze, address, and implement changes to create a more anti-racist curriculum and culture at Boston University School of Medicine. As all of you know, BSM has had a long commitment uh, to serving our underserved patients, to social justice, to advocacy, and addressing health disparities. BMC is the largest safety net hospital in New England, and 75% of our patients who we care for are underserved. And BUSM has the history of graduating the first US African-American woman, Rebecca Lee Crumpler. Um, but despite our history, what we found was that we weren't naming racism. We weren't making the connections for students um, and really had some work to do. And so today we'll highlight that process for you um, and the work, work of the Vertical Integration Group. Hello, everyone. It is truly a pleasure to get to speak with you today. As Dr. Gray, Dr. Kaplan mentioned, I am Kaylee, and I am truly tickled to be back at the med school. It does feel like coming home from even just across town. And so wanting to bring a, just an introduction to what the Vertical Integration Group was able to do and what our process looked like. And so these are the five major steps, starting at the catalyst, mission alignment, our commission and assessment, our major outcomes, and implementation phase. And we'll be able to break each of those down. 
So the catalyst, how did we get here? I like to think that all great things sort of happen as either kitchen conversations or hallway conversations, and this one was no different. There's a group of first year medical students who has an honor to be a part of that really were able to get, get together and think about how can we take racism out of the pedagogy of medicine? How can we begin to look at that more broadly? And then also recognizing that the historical drivers that have built this into the system, and then with the truly most unfortunate but well-timed um, nexus of everything happening nationally, it really created an opportunity for this work to both move forward as well as to be integrated into the broader conversation. And moreover, I think the true success of this work has been the partnership. I have truly had the pleasure of working with Dr. Garg. We were probably on the phone multiple times a week or on Zoom throughout the pandemic. And it's been a true treat to see how student activism and institutional objectives can come together to create something that I truly believe is unique and has had a large impact um, on the community at Broad. And so what is a big, as a vertical integration group, it is a, a team who has been commissioned by the Medical Education Committee to be able to look into a singular topic broadly, to begin to do the digging of the work, to see how are we managing it through our curriculum. So we were commissioned in May of 2019, and we were able to submit our report almost a year later on June 12th of 2020. So our group had five goals, and I'm going to sort of take a broad perspective. The goals are listed here on the side, but we wanted to really anchor into these five things of how does history, how does where we've come from really impact how we are moving forward and thinking about how racism was baked into the history of medical education and medicine and how do we now change that? How do we look at what's going on at our peer and aspirational peer institutions and how can we see how other curriculums are beginning to integrate this into whole best practices? What is our curriculum doing so well? And there's so many great areas to highlight and also where can we grow? What are opportunities for us to really look at how can we change? But the big things that we really want to do are these final two is it's not just about identifying, it's about how can we support and gather together to make a change. So where are the tools and resources needed for faculty? And then also what are the recommendations, both the competencies, thinking about educational learning objectives, as well as thinking about recommendations for culture and the climate of the school that we can propose back to the medical education office. And so what was our process? Our big used a few different methods, but the two core sections was an external review. I had a professor I used to work with that said R&D can also mean repeat and duplicate as much as means research and development. So we wanted to see who is doing it well, who's done it well. And so the schools listed on the right hand of the slide are the places that have racism, medicine, or anti-bias curriculum that we were able to look into and learn from their uh, from all of their work that they have done. And then our internal assessment, this was a truly a group lift from so many uh, now fourth year medical students and third year medical students who looked into every single course, slide set, practice question to see where could we improve and where were we doing really well. And so this all culminated in the reports you'll see on the left. And so that is really looking at uh, how can we dig into the work and it shows a great list but our key recommendations our top five are the ones listed on the right and as Dr. Garg mentioned earlier naming racism how can we recognize the structural inequity and thus begin to understand the downstream effects that come from it how can we begin to challenge the biological framework and tease out the difference between race and genetics how do we support our faculty? This is not a topic that has been taught for the last 50 years of our faculty coming into training. This is a place where faculty are growing alongside their students. And then how can we really look to do the last two, make this a longitudinal implemented program that has didactic support and build competencies and equity focused goals around the curriculum. So I thought I'd go in to a little detail of some of the key findings of the report. And um, just to give Kay Elise and the other faculty credit on what work they did, they produced a 137 page report, which is available on our website and can be seen by anyone. Um, and one of the things that they said was a change that needed to be made was naming racism. For many years, we have taught the students about social determinants of health, we've taught them cultural competency, but we haven't made the connection for them that racism is what has led to structural inequities, which is why patients don't have access, it's why patients don't have housing, and that's really what's led to poor health outcomes. 
The next thing we wanted to really talk about and have tried to implement is being clear that race uh, is not a biologic construct. So a lot of the things that uh, students were hearing from faculty was that there are genetic differences from race. And that's one of the reasons that we're using different treatments or different tools. And we all know that genetically, most races are similar rather than different. And so we really had to do work to change that belief and make sure all of our fa faculty understood that race is a social construct. The next thing we wanted to be clear and help our students um, to see more were the images that were put up in the classroom. So when our students and our faculty are taking care of a diverse population of patients, they're seeing all skin colors and all tones. And seeing a dermatologic image um, on the screen always in our white patients and never seeing it in a brown skinned individual makes it difficult for them to transition to the clinical environment. So we made that change. Um, with a lot of help. And so from here, we are able to do the analysis and now what does implementation look like? So Dr. Gar gave some amazing examples of how we're thinking about curricular change and really implementing the findings of the report into the curriculum. We've partnered this by also developing broader initiatives. And so some of the big initiatives that we've been able to do, partnering with BMC, really looking at the graduate medical education, as well as BUMG, and thinking about the broader conversation there is developing an equity glossary. If you're gonna make change, having a common canon of terms is a really important opportunity for us to understand and also work together in community on knowing what to say. And this really leans into the last section of partnership. This is about all of us together, both here at the School of Medicine, as well as our clinical partners at BMC and the other schools and centers here at BU of how can we really grow together in developing a more anti-racist community. And so another great outcome that I will truly say that I've had the pleasure of benefiting from is the Diversity and Inclusion Fellowship. I was truly honored to be the first fellow last year. And this fellowship is really focusing on how can we uplift students who have a great desire to increase diversity and inclusion of our community and find a project that pushes forward institutional goals. This, the VIG and this opportunity was a perfect praxis and a perfect nexus that I was able to support the curriculum development. And so the four components of the fellowship are curriculum reform and development. That was the majority of my work, the great benefit of spending a lot of time with Dr. Gard and the entire MEO staff. Also thinking about partnership as we talked about, the Equity Glossary was a major project that I was able to push forward with great colleagues and now dear friends over at BMC who helped create a canon of knowledge. And that glossary is in its final stages of development and hopefully this fall we'll be able to be uh, released and sent out and we'd be more than happy to send you the information for that. Next is scholarship. We know that the world, especially science, moves forward by doing research and understanding. And so I've had the great joy of getting to work and publish this year on different components of diversity and inclusion. And then lastly, lastly is the Pathway Program Support. This fellowship was largely funded by Vertex and their great support of our EMSSP program. And I was really tickled to get to join into that program family and support developing a professionalism curriculum to better equip our students who are matriculating into the medical school feel better prepared for joining the Institution of Medicine. So from here, we talked about different versions of um, implementation. And lastly, it's about competencies. How can we make sure that every student coming through BUSM understands the concepts? And so this is what you're seeing on the left hand is our new health equity competencies that will begin in August 2022. And really looking, you can hone into the ones at all of them that bring in naming racism, as well as looking at historical drivers. Lastly, the imperative to address health equity in medicine is a new session that we started in first year orientation. So we're not waiting till graduation, we're not waiting till halfway through. On day two or three of medical school, we're beginning to have this conversation around health equity. So one of the things I wanted to share and give credit to Kaylise is her desire and all of ours to really disseminate this information so that all schools can move forward. So what you're seeing is the publication that will be coming out in academic medicine in the next month, which Kaylise first author, which describes our process so other schools can utilize that. The second thing we realized was the faculty development that was needed. So a team of our faculty along with our office 
created a guide. It's a, it's a guide for faculty who are entering the classroom to understand what should you think about when you think of inclusivity? What are the steps you've taken? What should you be analyzing in your teaching materials? And then lastly, the glossary, which Kaylee's already spoke about. The next thing that I thought was really critical to our work in order to maintain and sustain change was to implement the work we had done into our continuous quality improvement process. So all of our uh, courses are required to analyze the data we send them and to meet with me and speak about um, the action items and changes they'll be making in the following year. And we embedded health equity and the big recommendations into that. And each um, group had to respond to how they, they changed their course. And um, as Dr. Kevin said, 80% of the 372 recommendations were implemented. Finally, nationally, we've really felt that Boston University School of Medicine should be a leader across the country and making sure that we're seeing the change that we want to see in our own school across all schools. So I've had the pleasure of co-chairing a, a committee for the AAMC Medical Education Senior Leaders focused on creating change in uh, anti-racist learning environments. And what you see on the left is the publication we put out in January, um, where it guides other schools on the immediate short-term and, and long-term action steps they should be taking. And then on the right, I have the pleasure um, in November of being part of a panel that will be speaking at the AAMC national meeting. And Kay Elise and I both spoke in, as invited presenters last year at the AAMC on our work. So to, to really summarize our discussion, um, we think over our journey over the last two years that everyone should realize that racism continues to impact the Institute of Medicine and medical training. That our self-assessment process and the work of the vertical integration group was critical to making the changes at our institution. That this, when faculty make changes in their, this area, you really need specific recommendations. You need to be granular with them and you need to provide them the faculty development they need to lead the anti-racist curricular efforts. The creation of the Diversity and Inclusion Fellowship, the funding to be able to do that was essential to the outcomes we see. And um, we're so thrilled that we have our second fellow working with us to really embed the new curriculum changes for next year. Um, and then finally, our work has just begun. Even though we're proud of what we accomplished in a year, there is so much work to be done. And I hope that students in the next 10 years face a very different experience in medicine and that we've made changes in our learning environment in the way that we hope. So we really appreciate everyone's time and we thank you. Thank you so much. Very good. Um, do we have comments in the chat? No. I, I have a couple of questions. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Lou, Lou Sullivan. First of all, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, uh, presentation. I think I have three questions and I'll give them all three, uh, all three of them so you can comment. One, the first question is, the, stu the schools which you chose to uh, interact with, um, if you could comment on how they were, were chosen, uh, that, that's the first thing. Uh, secondly, <clears throat> uh, to um, comment that you are probably aware of an initiative that's underway at the National Academy of Medicine uh, that is chaired by Dr. Cato Lorenzen uh, that um, <clears throat> started about four years ago uh, as a result of the AAMC's report uh, that showed that the number of black males entering medical school in 2015 uh, was actually 25 fewer than in, in 1978, whereas the number of black females had increased uh, significantly. So this working group at the National Academy that Dr. Lorenzen uh, heads up, and I, I happen to be a member of it, but there are about 50 of us from around the country has been looking at this. So my question is, have you interacted with that group? And are you familiar with their activities because there are opportunities for some interactions uh, there? And then my final question relates to uh, the composition of the committee there. Uh, it, do you have students uh, and members of the community uh, in the discussions uh, to, it discuss issues such as effective communications or developing trust and understanding uh, because of course in the health um, care interactions uh, you have the health professional on one side and you have the patient on the other and so the question is um, uh, 
the patient's perspective on uh, the health system or the health professional, because in many ways, such as the COVID pandemic, you have people who don't trust the system and who don't utilize the system because they have misconceptions or fears that they won't receive the correct treatment or that might be used um, in some experiment, et cetera. So those are my questions about your project. Thank you for the questions, Dr. Sullivan. I'll let Kaylee start with how we pick the schools. Maybe we'll start there. Thank you so much for your questions, Dr. Sullivan. So the schools were chosen by doing a literature nationally of where were we seeing people publish, as well as looking at different schools who had released information on their programs. And so that was our first instance of how we found the baseline schools. And then we also began, as we started with one school, we would ask, do you know of any other school who's producing a program or as a program director that'd be willing to discuss with us? And that is how that list was narrowed down to our main 12 to dig into the programs that they were currently administering. In terms of your question about the National Academy of Sciences, so my double AMC committee that I just spoke about um, is aware of the work that's being done. And so our committee reports to Allison Whelan and Kate McOwen who work for the double AMC in the academic um, structure. And so we are working, one of our um, goals for that, our committee is to actually work with many partners and liaison so the work doesn't keep getting replicated at these institutional levels or at separate committees. Um, and so that's one of our goals is to partner. So if you have a suggestions for how we could do that successfully, I would love um, your help with that uh, because we, we found that there are many groups, even within the AAMC, all doing the same work. Um, and we really want to make sure we move things forward rather than all of us doing the same thing. Um, and then um, to your third question about patients, which I think is a very valid one and one we often don't think enough about on the medical school side, BMC has taken a huge um, initiative and in also um, making health equity one of their priority and strategic goals. So I sit on their committee um, from the side of representing the UME medical education piece. And so they have embedded patients in the community perspective and in a much um, more holistic way. And so I'm able to gain that knowledge from them. But you're right, this is a, a next goal for us uh, that we'll take in terms of including patients. There's another comment in the chat, wonderful presentation. And this is from David Edelstein. What are the metrics for success which we should follow? But I did want to reiterate my comment in the chat that I think it's to their credit that they actually started this process uh, a year before the uh, demonstrations so that actually the timing was perfect. The report was coming in just when this became a national priority and therefore they were able to take a, um, they were able to take, that's a bad idea. And they were able to take a, um, a leadership role nationally in uh, this discussion. Um, in terms of the metrics of success, I'll just say two things about that. One, we wanted to make sure that what was recommended was implemented. So as I shared, our first metric was how many of the recommendations can we actually implement and how quickly. Um, but the second piece is more the long-term changes to the culture. Um, and so I'm just going to let Kaylee share for a moment the grant and the work that we've been trying to do um, with BU. Dr. Alistair, your question is so timely. We've been in the process of developing a grant to really look at assessment to make sure that this curriculum is doing what we hope it will, both on the in-class practical level, our students gaining the knowledge necessary to understand the historical connection to current pathology. But secondarily, are we changing the culture that this feels like a place that no matter what patient you see, the care will be given in a way that truly is done in an anti-racist and equitable manner. And so we're in the process of finalizing our team and getting that to be submitted. And we'll be hopefully submitting that in the next few weeks. And we've been collaborating with Dr. Woodson yes. and the center mm -hmm. at BU to do that together. And a follow-up question to that is, are there plans for a uh, periodic uh, progress report? Is there a schedule for that? Um, there isn't a schedule. We've talked a lot about, and that's actually one of the things I have for the small group later, if you're joining, is really how do we communicate and disseminate this to the students, staff, and faculty so that there's an awareness of the change we're making. Um, we did share some in, in the BU today in the communications that just came out this last um, month, but we'll continue to do that with the faculty and the students. 
I think the grant also to that question is hopefully will help create a rhythm of having an assessment profile very similar to what Dr. Gargas created for all of the other courses that are happening. Are there any uh, hand raises? Any? Yes. yes. Uh, lovely shirt trick. Yes, hi. Um, nice to see everybody. Uh, I'd like to ask a couple of questions and I'd like to say that I think that what you're doing is quite amazing and extraordinarily difficult. Um, speaking as a white woman and learning about my own racism at this time late in my life um, as a physician and as an individual, I'd like to make sure that you add all of the things that go on between student and student and student and faculty and faculty and faculty, whether it be the daily microaggressions or whatever. It's not just one group you're talking about, it's a much larger picture. It's uh, a life learning and it's very, very different and very, very difficult. Um, if you've worked with the faculty, I have two questions actually. If you've worked with the faculty at all yet, I was very curious to hear um, what their reactions have been to you? Because my guess is the first reaction is I'm not racist. And so I'd very much like to hear what happens. Um, and secondly, I'd like to know if you are involved or is there, is there another group that's involved in supporting particularly students, but not only students, obviously faculty as well at BUSM who have experienced racism and obviously have, have feelings for it or need, to ha need help with dealing with it, either in the classroom or out of the classroom. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll start with the faculty piece and your comments um, are so on target with, you know, obviously this is a really difficult thing. And I think as Dr. Kendi says, like nobody is racist, everyone has racist and anti-racist moments and we have to have an awareness. So we started actually with um, microaggression training that we did for all of our faculty small group teachers last year. Um, and so we, we started so that they had the right words so they could dialogue with our students when they were in small groups was the first thing. Our faculty are amazing actually in the classroom and they weren't defensive. They more weren't aware of what they were saying and the VIG allowed them to actually see grandly what were the words they were saying and how was that being perceived by a student and then to understand that perception matters. And yes. so even though your intention may not have been to hurt someone that, that that's how it was perceived. So we, I think the faculty, they are the ones who created the guide by saying, this is what we've learned this year. And so this is what we'd like to put into steps for all teachers. So that's been amazing. Um, and then we've worked also with BUMG, our medical group. They had a group of um, early mid-career faculty who worked with us to also help to do some faculty development work. So that's been done as well. Um, and then in terms of the students, Kaylee, I don't know if you wanna to speak to how we talk about racism and how that dialogue is happening, maybe through the Conversation Coalition. Let me ask you. Absolutely. Oh, sure. Thank you so much for your question. I also, to add to Dr. Gard about the faculty, one of my great joys of last year being a fellow is I had majority faculty conferences. And so I got to do a lot of one-on-one -on -one work to have the conversations about how do we tweak, where do we change, and how do we really come together to move things forward. On the peer-to-peer -peer conversation, and even just how do you reckon as a student with this, I think there's a few avenues. We haven't found the silver bullet. I feel like with any version of trauma, there is no singular right answer. And so something that we've been thinking about is how do we make sure there is a clear understanding that this is something you can bring forward, that this is something that can go through our ATM process if you want to do it anonymously. This is something that my role as a DNI fellow to be a, a singular sounding board, at least to have someone who you know can meet you at eye level, to have that opportunity. I think also our DNI office and our deans, and really thinking about a few different efforts coming through our student affairs office on how can we create safe spaces to talk about these things and really making sure our SAO deans are accessible. But we're really looking for what's the right rhythm, and there's some interesting work going on, going on at the hospital around the same conversation for residents. Mm -hmm partner and or mirror some of the work that they're doing there. I, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate what you're doing and how hard you're working. And the only thing 
I would like to add is that I think it's so, so, so important to include the white students. It's so, so, so important on your level um, where you're at. They, they have to be a part of this. They can't just ask you to teach them. Thank you, Doctor. Do, Thank you. Uh, are there any other hands raised at this point? Dr. Dr. Dahab. Oh, Dr. Dahab. Hi, um, I just have to tell you, it was a very, very inspiring presentation. I really liked it. That's why I want all your slides. I asked Dr. Antman to share these slides with us. Um, but my, my question was, have you thought about asking Dr. Candy to come over and have a presentation at the medical school? So he did join us last year at the beginning of the year, both Dr. Kendi's, because one is in our pediatric department, twice. his his wife, twice. and then twice. Oh, twice. twice. Yeah, but for the students, um, initially, they had a conversation, actually, in an open forum that was run by the Diversity Inclusion Office, where he shared his thoughts, and the students were able to ask questions in the community. Um, we know he's very busy, so uh, we try to be thoughtful about it, but... Um, Dr. Sadiqa Kendi, who's on our campus, is also very engaged in, in the work. She's the chief of pediatric emergency medicine. So yes, she, uh, I, I, I'm aware of that, uh, that she's part of uh, the um, medical uh, BMC. But, so how was the response uh, to Dr. Kendi's presentation? What, what, was, what did you guys feel? Like, what was the gut? What was the... What did you get out of it in the sense that what was this, where were the students were at or the, where the faculties were when, uh, with the presentations or at the end kind of thing? So I, I guess I'll start first is that we did a book club with the students last year with Dr. Kendi's book and had small groups with faculty and students. And I think that was a very effective forum where we actually took chapters and and thoughts that he had and discussed them. And that's where we really got to talking about our own experiences, things like colorism and how students have faced that regardless of what, what their actual you know, ancestry and ethnicity may be. We talked about the experiences of childhood and how that impacts the way you perceive the environment. And so although Dr. Kendi came as a panelist and spoke to the group, and I think the students, it was wonderful for him to articulate really a lot of the words in his book. I think what was deeper and what's deeper for the students is actually having a conversation with peers and faculty to actually talk about their own experiences and how they um, think about Dr. Kendi's words and how it relates to their own life. Because in order for them to see patients, I think with the most open perspective in mind, they have to really understand the power, the privilege that they may have experienced and their own experiences with bias before they can actually go into the encounter and understand the experience of patients. Very good. My last thing, last question, comment on this uh, DEI is so we talked about diversity. How about the gender part of it? Yeah, so that's the second integration group that's been working over the last two years on gender diversity. They also have a report on our website, and they were part of the group that created the faculty development guide, and their recommendations are in that guide as well. So we've been doing a lot of work on language so uh, faculty and students understand the difference between identity and biologic sex. Um, and so we've been doing a lot of work and changes there as well. Oh, thank you for all of you who have commented. Uh, the discussion will continue in the uh, breakout sessions a little later this afternoon. Uh, in a few moments, uh, we will uh, welcome Dr. Tom Pearls, professor of medicine and founder and director of the New England Centarium Study. But first, let's just take a quick three minute stretch uh, just to get up and uh, make sure we're uh, prophylaxing against DVT. We'll be back in three minutes.
Are we ready? Okay. To... We're gonna start again. Can everybody hear okay? They've got a great view of your shirt. <laughs> uh oh. Am I? No, his shirt. Oh, there we are. Are we on? Can everybody hear all right? Great job. Did somebody give a thumbs up if you can hear us? Uh, up Excellent. Thank you so much. Welcome back, everyone. Um, we're um, going to uh, begin a presentation about the uh, New England centenarian study. Centenarian. centenarian study. I keep leaving off of, of, the, of, of at least one syllable there. Uh, this has a lot of practical implications for a very large number of us on the Dean's Advisory Board. So <laughs> we appreciate that this is the largest and most comprehensive study of centenarians and their families in the world. And that we're thrilled to have Dr. Pearls with us today to share some exciting updates on this study. Dr. Pearls. Well, thank you, Dean. And thanks everybody for having me present today. I'm thrilled to be here with you all. And I do hope that, uh, as you'll see, that living to 100 has a lot of practical applications for everybody who's listening. Um, just waiting for a presentation to pop up here. Um, I'm a professor of medicine and geriatrics here at the medical school. I'm an attending physician in geriatrics at um, at the Boston Medical Center as well. And I spend the predominant amount of my time uh, researching centenarians and their families with some of the time also on the boards. So here we go. Almost getting there, everybody. So. Oh, there. No, that's Karen. Karen. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. First slide, Tom. Sure. Okay. Are everybody okay. on Zoom see um, the centenarian presentation? Nope. I'm not seeing it. Oh, well, good. Okay. Um, Can everyone see it now? Yep. Okay. Fabulous. So I'm going to hopefully speak only for about 15 minutes and then leave some time for questions. And of course, people should know that if they have other questions, they can contact me. I think my email address will be at the end. Um, so centenarians and their families. Uh, here's some photos, uh, obviously the uh, one on the left was a recent visit with the masks on with uh, one of my research assistants. Uh, in the middle is uh, a, um, a centenarian and her daughter. Uh, we studied the kids, but the kids are in their uh, 70s and 80s. We've even had a kid who was 100, who I'll describe in a little bit. Um, and uh, the picture on the right is the guy on, on the far left. But um, we just visited him a couple of weeks ago. I like to go on some of these visits with the research assistants. And this is a 107 year old man holding his uh, memento of his fighting in the Battle of the Bulge. And we were hearing amazing firsthand accounts. These folks are our living historical treasures. And I can't tell you what a thrill it is 
to meet somebody like this. And that's his uh, daughter, age 81, on the left. And the women tend to be a little on the short and, and plump side, interestingly, and the guys tend to be pretty thin. Um, but the children are very much following in the footsteps of their parents. And, and that's why we, in terms of, they have half the rate of heart disease, stroke, diabetes, cancer of other people uh, born around the same time. And I'm going to describe what the uh, medical and uh, disability histories of the centenarians are in a moment. But uh, we have 2,500 subjects in the study now. Um, only about 10% of our sample is alive at any one time because the mortality of these people who are 100 or older can be high. And uh, uh, we have several grants now that um, are going to boost that number up to 4,200 over the next couple of years. But I should say the New England Centenarian study, uh, some people don't know this, but that picture is me with my great grandmother. And she was, she lived to 102. Wow. And, um, and I didn't start the study because of that. It's just by chance that that happened to be my family history. So um, people who live to 100 are rare, but those who live to 110 years are the super rare and in fact are called super centenarians. I, the, the group as a whole is really unusual, rare and special. 100 year olds generally are about one for 5,000 in the population. People who live to 105 to 109 are what we call these semi super centenarians. At 105, it's about one per 250,000 in the population. And people who live to 110, super centenarians are one per 5 million. At any one time in the United States, we have about 60 or 70 super centenarians in the population. We've accumulated now over 200 super centenarians in our study, uh, by far and the way largest sample of these spectacular folks. Um, this is our oldest person in our study, uh, Sarah Knaus, who lived to 119. She's the one who had the 100-year-old daughter, uh, the only <laughs> mother-daughter pair we have in the study. And uh, this is actually a picture with her great, great, great grandson, uh, about eight, a little less than two years old in that photo. Now we have one other family that has that number of living generations. Um, and, and that's a situation where the moms from one generation to the next had a history of having kids at a young age. So we, that, the matriarch in that family was about 105. Thank you. Thank you. So people uh, age differently from one another um, at younger ages uh, in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. At, and, and much of that, I would say, is due to differences in health behaviors from one person to the next. The vast majority of how we age, the variation is explained by health behaviors. But when you start wanting to live much beyond 90, um, then we see a growing role for genetics and the, and the influence of genes and explaining the variation at these greatest ages um, just goes up and up such that by the time you get to 110, it's the tables are turned instead of 75% of it being health behaviors, about 75% is gonna be um, combinations of, of genes. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is that at about 100, 15% of our centenarians are those who just have no aging related diseases. Uh, they, um, they're what we call escapers. Now we have these survivors who've had aging related diseases even before the age of 85, but they just deal with the diseases much better than others. They're very resilient. Uh, and then we have these delayers who have age related diseases after age, age 85. Um, the fact that about 90% are not escapers may make, be, may make people think that uh, what's so good about that, but 90%, I know I went a little backwards here, but in, in, in how I showed things, but 90% of 
of centenarians are independent at an average age of close to 95. So they're markedly delaying any disability towards the end of their very, very long lives. And uh, that's spectacular. And we want to understand the resilience and the underlying causes of that. Um, we also want to understand why the super centenarians are able to not only delay uh, disability, but they also delay um, they also delay uh, their diseases as well. So um, here I, I talk about um, how so much of getting to these most extreme ages seems to be genetic. And it's not just one gene, some powerful gene, but that rather it's a combination of genes with individually pretty modest effects in terms of their effect on aging and longevity, but it's getting the right combination that is, is really what's going on here. It's a bit like the lottery. If you get one or two numbers, that's not a big deal. Getting all seven numbers is a big, big deal. Getting all 200 or so gene variants uh, it is probably why these people are so incredibly rare. Um, because they markedly delay diseases as well as disability up to about an age of 106 or so, uh, we don't think it's going to take very many supercentenarians to really make these discoveries of what makes them so special. That they're so alike, they likely have things in common that are getting them there. The other really interesting thing, that, and what's so optimistic about our studies, is that we believe that these are genes that slow down aging and decrease your risk for aging related diseases. It's not a matter of lacking disease associated genes. Um, the centenarians for the most part have just as many of those variants as the general population. What's probably really dis distinguishing them from others are these protective being, uh, genes. If we can discover what those genes are, their biological mechanisms, then you know, maybe this will even translate into drugs that could help us. Um, I don't really care about getting a bunch of people to, to 100. What I care about is getting a bunch of people to markedly delay or escape a disease like Alzheimer's disease. And that's why we are, that's really the mission behind our, our work here. We have three, and I'll tell you about a fourth study that we just got that are that's supporting our work in the NIH, the Centenarian Project of something called the Longevity Consortium, the Long Life Family Study, which we've been a part of since, well, I'm one of the originating PIs of that study that began in 2004 and has been going, I think we're in our fifth cycle of funding. Um, this most recent round of funding was $70 million, but spread across um, five universities. And uh, the BU site is one of the founding sites for this study of about 550 families that demonstrate clustering for exceptional longevity. And then we have the integrative longevity omics study that we've had now for a couple of years. It's a $9 million study doing what I call omicking the hell out of the centenarians. And what that's about is we um, do very careful phenotyping or getting a lot of information in, on these individuals, uh, clinical data, functional information. But then with their blood samples, we're collecting a, a whole range of data, uh, proteins, uh, metabolites, and uh, what, something called the methyl methylome. We get genetic data, gene expression data and now even microbiome data where we're collecting their fecal samples and we characterize all the different bacterial populations and working with a whole bunch of different BU faculty uh, on all these data that ultimately are shared um, through NIH uh, data sharing sites uh, to the other studies that would be interested in not only longevity and or exceptional longevity um, but also having a group of people who somehow don't get diseases that a lot of other scientists are studying. And these act as really wonderful controls for a whole range of studies. The other study that we are starting tomorrow 
is RADCO or the Resilience and Resistance Against Alzheimer's Disease in Centenarians and Offspring. It's a $20 million study over the next five years that I'm the uh, lead PI on. And uh, what this study is kind of looking at the creme de la creme of the subjects that we enroll in these other studies, the centenarians who have the cognitive function of people 30 years younger in their 70s and, and earlier. And trying to, and of those who demonstrate some evidence of Alzheimer's, either through blood markers or MRI, or even after they passed away on their neuropathology, um, seeing if they had evidence of Alzheimer's and still had this remarkable ability to um, be, to have great cognitive function at a hundred or older, or did they have no evidence of Alzheimer's disease and therefore are resistant, not just resilient to the disease? Uh, I'm getting sick and tired of um, typifying the genes and the proteins and everything. Now I really wanna understand the biological mechanisms and come up with treatments. And that's what Radco is gonna do. Um, we're doing, we're collecting a lot of information that I've already mentioned here. Um, and as well as now brain MRIs on these participants, getting blood and fecal samples, getting all this information. But then also we are giving blood to George Murphy and the group at the Center for Regenerative Medicine at BU. And they're going to, they already are, we have about 10 of these cell lines created already, these induced pluripotent stem cell lines. And George is going to take these lines and what he can do is create special different cells types out of those lines. So actually making um, neurons, special neurons called glial cells and astrocytes. And, um, and then suddenly we have brain cells of supercentenarians in a dish. And we can give those to our colleagues at Mass General Hospital, Rudy Tanzi, who's probably one of the best researchers in the world in Alzheimer's disease has a thing called AD in a dish, where they can take cells, these kind of brain cells from people with Alzheimer's disease and throw things like beta amyloid into the dish and actually see the formation of neuritic tangles and uh, nerve fibrillary tangles and neuritic plaques in the dish. <clears throat> and um, this time we're gonna put in there the brain cells from super centenarians and, and actually people 105 and older um, and see how they are different. Look at uh, all the biochemistry that's uh, going along with this to see what biological pathways seem to be causing resilience and resistance. And boy, is that just a step away from coming up with therapeutics. So we're just really excited about the translation component of this um, study. And uh, I think with that, um, I think the only other thing I would just add is the microbiome. Uh, we're working with a guy named Daniel Segre uh, over across the way at BU, who's one of the world's experts on the microbiome. So many people are interested in now in terms of the bacteria in our gut and the roles they play in both disease and healthy aging. And uh, so we're really, that's another big step for us. I think there, I, that's my last slide. Your new question so far. Okay. You say you said it. So Patricia here's a question, are the studies. Oh yeah, Patricia Williams, are the studies looking at quality of life in addition to longevity and centenarians. Yeah, we've been paying a lot of attention to that. Really, the, the, we've come up with this uh, idea with the delay of disability of it not being the older you get, the sicker you get. But these centenarians are showing us this very optimistic view of aging um, of the older you get, the healthier you've been. and. With that delay and disability, with um, them being so special and families being so proud of them, and they have these personalities that they tend to be very gregarious. Um, they're, they're very socially connected and the quality of life of these individuals is really spectacular. So 
some people will say, well, who wants to live to 100? And, and I will tell you that uh, those who get there are very happy with it. And, and their kids, too, are just thrilled that they seem to be, for the most part, so much following in the footsteps of their parents. Second question, Dr. Edelstein. Dr. Edelstein asks, why do the Japanese have the largest percent of centenarians per population? Um, maybe not. Um, there, the, we've looked at pretty closely whether there's any place in the world that has more centenarians than others. And um, that's probably not the case. There's blips. You know, for a while we were really interested in the um, west coast of Prince Edward Island, where there's a real concentration of, um, where we thought there was a real concentration of centenarians. And, and that's kind of interesting for Boston um, because Halifax back in the early 1900s had a big sh ship blow up uh, that leveled about a third to a half of the city. And, um, and Boston was the first place to bring you know, health and, and uh, you know, supplies to, to the region. Ever since, uh, Halifax gives this big Christmas tree um, for the commons as a thank you. Uh, and we've had a lot of centenarians from here, from Halifax. So we just got really interested in whether um, there was a concentration. Uh, and, and I think for the most part, it, that's just not true. Um, there are regions of the world that have better health habits. Uh, for example, British Columbia probably has the highest average life expectancy in North America at about 83. They're well known for great health care, really good health habits, um, and so on. And, the, and Japan has its smattering of very, very old people, but I don't think their concentrations are much higher than um, than other, than other areas that may have high numbers of centenarians. Douglas McDonald, Dr. D McDonald. Yeah. Do, do, do the genes identified so far fall into the DNA handling and repair mechanism? Very much so, great question. Um, and many of those genes are on the X chromosome, which is also really interesting. As you know, uh, or you may not know, um, about 85% of centenarians are women and 15% are men. Women very much win the longevity marathon, so to speak. And part of this may be that they, you know, by having um, two X chromosomes the, through this lion hypothesis, uh, they can kind of, the, the biology selects for the better of the two variants on the two chromosomes in terms of those more conducive to exceptional longevity and healthy aging and, and not getting bad diseases that, that uh, have mortality at younger ages. So um, that's a really, really interesting thing that we are fervently pursuing um, is why women seem to do so much better than men. And this idea that a lot of the genes that may be related to exceptional longevity are on the X chromosome. What about uh, mismatched repair and other repair mechanisms? Do you know anything about repair mechanisms with, with respect to this group? Well, there's DNA repair genes, and uh, and that's of course we're we're very uh, interested in that. Um, there's also other. There's a whole range of genes. Um, that are being discovered that either uh, increase rate of aging and also slow it down. And, and one of the reasons scientists are so interested in the centenarians is that they can test these hypotheses looking at what we've found so far. And we're actually also doing this in, in lower organisms. We have um, scientists studying aging in lower organisms. They come up with candidate genes and we quickly look to see what's going on with the centenarians. Liz has a question, Karen. Yeah. Sure. Um, are you doing a parallel uh, assessment of their psychologic status as well? Because it's it, I have two centenarians in my family, both of whom are aware of the film, are gregarious, outgoing, and totally normally sentient. Are, are they alive? One's alive and one's not. We, I need to talk to you. We know. 
certainly we've done, we did personality testing along with some other studies that uh, study centenarians um, quite some time ago now. They score quite high, interestingly, in conscientiousness and, ex and extroversion, which are really conducive to being a likable person. And, uh, and conducive to also social networks and talking with other people, being cognitively engaged and so on. Um, they score low in being Woody Allen, being, a, a, a neur <laughs> being neurotic. And it uh, means that they may manage their stress much better than yeah, others rather than neurotics tend to dwell on their on things that are not going well they their stress tends to get to them more um, so those were some pretty interesting findings personality wise but a, a lifetime of dealing with stress in kind of a benign way yeah being they very do. adaptable yeah. and it's resilient very biologically important in terms of how your your genetic makeup allows right. you to age your not age and also in terms of diseases uh, it's diseases of aging which may occur with a change in frequency in people who are spent their life being calm. Right. Dr. Bottomley has a question. It's at the bottom. Yeah. Is, uh, is the number of centenarians increasing or decreasing since 1920? Very much increasing. When we started the study um, back in 1995, up through around 2000, the prevalence in economically well-off countries is about one per 10,000. Now it's one per 5,000. And it's not because the genes are changing, they're not, but uh, over that period of time, but rather I think it's a, an effect of two things. One is around 1900, um, the social conditions just got started to get so much better. We got clean water, we got clean water supply, uh, we started to get some vaccinations starting in the in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. We started to understand high blood pressure and some other major causes of cardiovascular disease. But around 1900, people lost about a quarter of their children to infectious diseases. There was a pretty very high mortality rate. But as socioeconomic conditions and clean water supply and so on got better much of that infant mortality disappeared. And so a quarter of the population that died now had a chance to age a bit and at least get into middle age. And then with further improvements in, in, in health and, and prevention, um, many of those individuals that would have died from infectious diseases and premature coronary artery disease and so on, now had the chance to get to even older age. And there's probably a bit going on in terms of better care of people in their 80s and 90s. But I'd say for the most part, much of this has been big demographic um, and, and, and public health changes that have allowed a lot more people who have the genetics to get to these extreme ages to actually fulfill that by living to these older ages, getting through what have been otherwise reversible causes of death. Dr. Surchuk? Um, She's at the top. You need to oh, unmute okay. Leslie. Leslie, yeah. Um, first thing, uh, vaccination certainly helped with that. Um, secondly, uh, I, I love the way um, when you talk about these folks, you have this wonderful smile on your face. I mean, you just get all soft. It's very sweet. Um, working uh, as a pediatrician in infectious disease, um, I get the other side of, of the uh, spectrum from the littlest of littlest. And I just have to say um, that I just love to see uh, the way you smile that way. But um, actually what I was going to ask was since these are very few and far between these patients, uh, where is your cohort from? Um, and are they international as well or only national? Are these studies where it's ongoing or is there really only one major visit? Uh, thanks for the, I'll thank my dentist uh, <laughs> for the smile comment. Um, but uh, I wish it was international, but um, collecting data where, you know, in one of the silver linings that there could be a silver lining at all to um, COVID is that 
um, it forced us to switch much of our data gathering efforts to uh, Zoom. Yes. And, yeah. uh, and we send these packages with these devices that people use over Zoom with us. And, um, and then we also have phlebotomists from around, from various cities uh, go to collect the blood samples for us instead of us uh, going to see folks in person. Um, so there may be a, the, a possibility in the future for us to do international studies. The other thing is working with George Murphy and these cell lines. We have to get our blood samples uh, to him within 24 hours. But the other samples that we get, we freeze at the time that the blood is drawn. So, I mean, I think you really touched on uh, pushing us uh, to go international. They are so rare and it would be really great. Um, the other really good thing about going international that we currently are depending upon maybe just three other studies is to have a large number of different cultures and, and races in the study because these formulas of what it takes to get to 100 and Absolutely. older really be different depending upon environmental exposures and the environments in which genes involved and so on. So it can be quite different than say um, people in Tibet and what have you. So it's really important that we have a really good mix of different types of subjects in the study. Um, but for the most part, it's the United States. We rely upon Google alerts to get, um, to learn about people who are turning 100 that might show up in the media. And then we use voter registration lists Perfect. Uh, to be able to find these people and send letters out. In, right. in, and you answered Shamim Dahoud, uh, does a diet make a difference and what about exercise? Oh, and then These diet and exercise make a huge difference to get to 90. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so be my, my advice, the reason why I say 90, and it's amazing to think that most, most people I think should be able to get to 90. And we base that upon the Seventh-day Adventist Health Study which has average life expectancy for men of 86 and about 89 for women. The Seventh-day Adventists are a very mixed group of people, but they have some habits dictated by their religion that they have in common. They're vegetarian, they don't smoke, they don't drink, um, maybe a little alcohol is okay. They eat in moderation, so they tend to be lean, and they have a lot of time with religion and family that may um, help them deal with stress better. Uh, and so, and, and they regularly exercise. So getting to 90 in good shape, the older you get, the healthier you've been, compress the time that you're sick towards the end of your life like that. Um, diet and exercise is really, really important for all of us. One last question, one last very question. briefly. What did COVID do to your study? Yeah, it was very hard. And Dean Antman knows about this from me because she'd get a message from me about every month. When can we go back in the field? <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's true. Uh, and, and, we, and we quickly retooled and tried to do, and do this Zoom thing. But for subjects who are local, we, if, if the subject is vaccinated and our, and our research assistants are vaccinated and we still wear our masks, um, we feel it's safe to go and we, we go and see them. Very good. So thank you very much, Dr. Sure, thank for, you. Thank you. for sharing your fascinating work. Uh, we are now going to split up into breakout rooms for some more in-depth discussions. You've been pre-assigned to a breakout session mm -hmm. dependent on your interest survey. And let's reconvene you as, as a group at about 3.15 for a brief summation and closing remarks. So breakout sessions will begin now. Thank you. For those of us who have no clue how to get into a breakout session. Well, here we
been it, many years I've talked to yeah, him. Yeah. It's yeah. interesting. <laughs> it, it, be able to great. Okay. These, these Thank you. Yeah. It's it's interesting how how time goes by very quickly when it's a, a, a vigorous group discussion. We've had a, a good group at our our, our um, session, but I'll start um, uh, this oh, afternoon. Wait, oh, sorry. Wait a couple minutes. Okay. Just, All right. I'll restart. I can actually restart my yeah, iPad and see my sure. yeah. And then you could sit next to. Yeah, yes. I can only stay till three thirty. Let me know. Of course. Thank you so much. Yeah, we'll close by. We'll be done by three thirty. Let so, me know when we're. And, and we're, this is kind of a mess, but this is one page and that's another. Uh, Just do you want to report how? Because you, you, you can read your writing. Or you don't have to reuse the notes. Do you want to just well, go can, extemporaneously can, or you want me to chime my, in? Well, I'll try my best and you can add on, I guess. Yeah. It's like we're just about there. Good. And we have everybody back? Yes. Very good. Thank you. Well, as I just mentioned to our group, it, it just time goes very quickly when you when you're having a vigorous discussion. And we indeed did. We'll report on it uh, briefly in a few moments, but I'd like to start with the uh, anti-racism curriculum breakout group. Is there somebody reporting? Uh, we opened it up for someone to report. Is there anyone in the group who'd like to at this point? Otherwise, I'm happy to do it. Priya, why don't you summarize and people can add if, they, if there's something specific. I'd love to. So um, we started the, the conversation um, as a broad opening to, I really asked the group, could you help me to think about how we can move forward? Um, and we talked a lot about thinking first about the community and really having the community be a part of teaching the students. Um, Dr. Sullivan was sharing his thoughts around that and really thinking about how do we bring them in. I shared that we have community members come and teach sometimes in the classroom, but not actually engage in the curricular reform. And that went on actually to a discussion of maybe we could use the patient navigators and patient advocates at Boston Medical Center as a group that could come in and help us think about what patients are actually saying to them, the racism they might be facing in the hospital or the experiences they've had in the hospital and could be a really great group to inform how we teach the students. And then the last thing we talked about, or one of the other things was about using professional patients um, and actors. And I shared that we do have actors across our curriculum in the first two years but the diversity of our actors is, um, is not that strong. And it's something we've been trying to figure out as a medical school community um, in Massachusetts, how to expand the representation of our actors. But what's important about that is it allows students to understand how patients feel when they're speaking with them, um, rather than just learning the words of what to say. Um, and then we, we ended with the idea of, of really, could we, um, have an actor actually play the physician? So is there a way for um, a actor to share the words they've heard from their physicians, which are sometimes really hurtful, and for the students to actually, or the residents to be the one sitting on the other side as the patient, which I thought was a wonderful suggestion idea. And then the outcome we really talked about was, do patients understand what our students are saying to them? Do they understand their disease? Do they understand their medications? And really, how did it make them feel? Um, and so that was a, a really great measurement for me to think of. And then I'll just end by, we said that we think we have hope for the next generation, that we really do feel like across the country, there'll be change um, because our, this generation of our students and young people like my children are really at a level, I think, above any of us and are going to advocate and force the change across the country. So I have a lot of hope for that. Very good. Any, anybody in the group to add any other comment? I just add that uh, when I was uh, chief, one of the things I would always do is that interviewing physicians, particularly, I would choose their most obscure research paper and ask them to kind of explain it to me because I think physicians as communicators uh, is the most important, communication as physicians, most important function we, we have to perform and understanding uh, the ability to communicate with our patients and understand where they're coming from and being able to relate to them is, is crucial to be a physician. And if, if I might add um, just a, a comment, one of the issues I believe in having minorities, African-Americans and others utilize the system more is really using institutions in the black community or in the minority community 
that they trust, that they own, such as churches, black churches, as many of you know, uh, or institutions where not only health services are dispensed, but educational activities, uh, community meetings, et, et cetera. And one of the reasons is that that church belongs to the community. This is their institution. So therefore things that occur within their institution, they feel more comfortable with, feel that uh, they are getting uh, truly, represent, uh, tr truly represented, et cetera. So the degree to which we could utilize institutions in the community that are trusted for health services or to begin the dialogue, this could help rather than the current situation in so many instances where the health system is not seen as something that they own, but rather something that they don't understand, they don't trust, uh, they feel there's a bad history. So it really is a process to begin to turn that around uh, using institutions that are owned by the black community, therefore the trust relationship is there. Very good, excellent point as well. Uh, the student support breakout group, Susanna is gonna report. <laughs> Absolutely, so we were really fortunate to get to know one of our students, Rita Wang, who's sitting next to me, who's a fourth year student who's been supported by Dr. Brown scholarship. She is going into pediatrics She's come to us from across the country and has really enjoyed her time in Boston and shared with us a few particulars about her student experience. She talked about how helpful the Student Financial Services Office has been, that um, they have connected her with faculty mentors in particular and faculty deans. Uh, they've been a very helpful resource. We talked a bit, of course, about what it was like with COVID in the clinics and um, how it was challenging with the clinical schedule being delayed. Rita shared that Kaiser, you know, we have a Kaiser cohort in California, and I didn't know this, but Kaiser actually offered a full year's rotation during uh, the COVID times, and Rita was the only one who chose to split her year. A number of the others did do the full year at Kaiser, but Rita did half a year there and half a year at Boston Medical Center. Um, we talked about other ways that students are supported beyond financially um, for uh, didactics. Didactics for each rotation uh, was challenging, of course, with the testing center continuing to cancel exams. That's not our testing center. That's the national testing. <laughs> the center. national that's testing that's center. Natural for the for the boards. Yes, and they did. They kept canceling the medical students. Yeah, beyond our control. Oh, we couldn't. That's not us. Not us. So, but that was challenging, of course. Um, Dr. Tahod asked about what things we might be able to improve, and we made the point above and beyond the COVID situation because hopefully that won't be continuing forever. Um, we talked about differences between the Socratic or didactic teaching methods. We go with didactics. Um, we heard from Kay Elise about the difference between the medical school and the law school and that the law school employs the Socratic method. Um, I don't know if anyone else has anything to share on that point, Dean Adman. I think the Socratic method is terrific and we yep. use it clinically, but the students don't perceive it. They perceive it as humiliating rather than actually a, a major learning tool. Because of the anxiety level, you don't forget what you didn't remember. You know, basically you go back and, and you find it. To be done well, it's, it's a very special ta talent yes. to make sure that people do feel supported but yet challenged as they hear the question or they're, or they're yeah. essentially put on the spot. Right. right. And if they prepare, they'll look mm -hmm. terrific. Mm -hmm. I think I, Go ahead. I'd please. like to just add that we talked a little about the summer uh, research program. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually was a beneficiary of that in my undergraduate days at Brandeis, and it was a wonderful experience. The monetary stipend is not great, but it's enough to, to help you get through the summer, maybe make a little dent on your tuition. And uh, I feel very strongly about supporting this kind of program. And I'm sure that uh, Suzanne can give you more information if you're interested in supporting a student for, for a summer project. Uh, well, that's... and I want to thank you, Don, absolutely. And I want to give a, a special thanks to Leslie Sirchuk, 
along with her parents who have been supporting the Search Up family has been very generous in supporting our summer uh, enrichment program for students. And you supported our students. Yes, know that Rita benefited. So yes. that was terrific to hear. And we also spoke about the medical student residence and how that really is a helpful resource just to find housing. And furthermore, it is at a discount. So it does make living in Boston a little bit more affordable. Uh, Rita lived in the uh, medical residence for her first two years. And let me see, and we also talked about parking. The medical school does provide a 60% subsidy. It's still expensive, but that is better than full, obviously. And we talked about opportunities for students to have part-time jobs through the work study program. I mentioned that we do support, we have some work study students in our development office and across the school. And Dr. Catrimbone recognized how great it is to connect students with donors. We were really sad not to be able to have the scholarship dinner this year. But what we are offering is individual meetings between students and their donors. So anyone that's interested should let me know and we'll set that up. And then we will continue to look for opportunities to put student stories out there. And we did, uh, Dr. Catrabone also commended us for our great stewardship efforts, thanks to Corey and our students. And I hope that you all enjoy receiving those letters. Very good, thank you for that summary. And finally, we had a group that uh, discussed our Community Catalyst Center. Do we have a report from that group? Uh, we do. Um, I, I volunteered to provide the, um, the, the report from, from our group. We had a very good discussion um, about a new initiative in graduate medical sciences or GMS. And for those of you who were not in our group, we first started out with what is GMS? And we're the arm of the medical school that's responsible for master's and PhD programs in the biomedical sciences. So we have 34 programs. And each incoming class is about between 400 and 450 students. And so we talked about um, the heterogeneity of our programs. And so with the heterogeneity of our programs, we also have a lot of heterogeneity in our students. And one of the things that we took from our experience last year with our students, when students were uh, participating remotely from their living rooms and their kitchens and that sort of thing. There was an extreme loss of community. Um, the students were not able to interact in the classroom or in the hallways or to have lunch together to go out to the pub. And this resulted in a great deal of anxiety with the students and, um, and a disconnect. And so one of the things that Dr. Davies put together and Dr. Davies provided some slides on this is a, a new initiative from GMS. It's a community catalyst center, also known as C3. And it's designed to, um, to help foster a sense of belonging and community for individual groups such as LGBTQ, military and veterans. Um, I'm gonna forget all the individual programs, maybe Teresa can jump in, but for um, individual cohorts so that they can get together with specific programming for their particular interests, as well as programming for professional development, um, academic skills, uh, and, and other events, workshops and panels and things like that for all the GMS students. So this C3 Center, uh, is being put together to foster um, social learning. So we had a discussion about what the goals of this were, and this led into questions about um, the, the current students that we have and what is uh, their mental status and what kind of resources do we have. And so we talked about that and the support from student health services, our wellness programs, grief groups, uh, yoga, mindfulness, and things like that, many of which are being um, uh, um, presented through the C3 Center as well. And we also have a chaplain now in our GMS suite who is available for one-on-one -on -one interactions. So, and the feedback has been very positive from the students. This is new. It's just started in September. So, of course, one of the questions was what percentage of students are coming um, 
what are the numbers of the target demographics and success metrics. So we talked about these different things. Again, this is a new program. So we started with the first years about about 25 to 30 percent of our incoming class is uh, from historically underrepresented groups in the biomedical sciences. So we've had three events in the first month and we've had uh, participation in each of them, not as much as we'd like, but we anticipate that participation will increase as word of this gets around and we do more marketing as well. Um, so uh, this led into a question about, are we going to expand it to other groups such as parents, which is appropriate to our, our older students, um, individuals with disabilities and that sort of thing. And so we talked about uh, the different ways that this could be expanded in the future. And um, a final comment from, from one of the participants was that, this was a very comprehensive approach to develop community within our graduate students. And it's important for group interactions to help them get help and to encourage them to seek out resources. And the final question that we didn't get to answer because we were coming back into this space was, is there a physical space for this center? And the answer is yes, there is. It's right across the hall from our GMS suite. Excellent. Thank you very much. And this has really become a focus uh, on many campuses of uh, providing uh, uh, better uh, uh, orientation, better uh, community for uh, um, our students. And I'm glad that BU is taking a leadership role here as well. Uh, Dean Antman has a comment and uh, then I'll wrap up. I did want to just make sure that many of you uh, would be watching this. Drew Weissman is one of our MD PhD alumni. Uh, he just got the Lasker Prize. There is some talk about the possibility of a Nobel Prize. So we will be watching along with his current institution, University of Pennsylvania on Monday at 530 to see whether or not that might happen. It's always a long shot for anything like a Nobel Prize. But I just wanted you to be aware and if if he is announced as a winner, keep in mind that that is one of our MD PhD alums. Right. We're very proud of what he and um, Caitlin Carroll has have done with mRNA viruses, and they've gotten a, they've been gotten some very worthwhile prizes uh, over the last uh, two or three months for the work that they've done uh, on mRNA um, uh, immunizations. Yeah, I, I've had the privilege of speak of hearing him speak. Uh, he's been awarded a number of. Uh, prizes so far and, and probably will be in line uh, for that very significant one, but he's a wonderful speaker as well. So if you uh, want, if you really want to hear a very fine presentation, I can highly recommend it, I'm sure. That he is coming, he will be speaking, whether he gets it or not, he's speaking at our Evans Day on Thursday, and you, you, we can certainly get you registered if you would like to hear him speak, yeah. on just on the basis of the work that he's been doing to date. 3 to okay. 4 p.m. It's 3 to 4 p.m. on Thursday. Very good. We're slightly behind time, yeah. which is not my usual policy, but it's been a vigorous conversation, and I think it's been a very uh, exceptionally good afternoon. So I'd like to thank all of you who participated, also our presenters and guests for joining us today. And also a very special thanks to you as board members for the remarkable support uh, that you've given to uh, many individuals and programs at the medical school. Um, please reach out to the Dean, myself, or Suzanne here, uh, or any of the BUSM development team if you have other questions or comments. And uh, a, a, a final reminder is that we're hopeful that the Key for Society dinner will be held in person in the spring. Yes. So please reserve Thursday, April 28th for the dinner. And that will be followed by the Spring Dean's Advisory Board meeting on Friday morning, the 29th, 2022. Please be sure to mark your calendar and please keep your fingers crossed. And please get your uh, updated COVID vaccine when it comes available. <laughs> so this concludes our meeting. Thank you all again so much for your participation. Please stay away, stay safe, and be well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye now. Take care. Bye. Thank you.